make this project that I've done that was selling. So I do things like that. <laughs> I'm Washington Gowdy, and uh, I work in the data center group, in, uh, mainly on cryptography and compression type algorithms. And I'm Steve Grobman from the Intel Security Group, and basically everything security technology. Uh, I'm Hong Jian, uh, I'm in the Intel Graphics uh, Division. I manage the uh, media architecture team. Uh, Genevieve Bell, Intel Labs, research social scientist and UX person. So, Stephen Jordan, I'm the uh, Chief Architect and Board well, and I lead the architecture and definition of uh, Intel's SOCs. Uh, Mark Bohr, I work in the Logic Technology Development Group, uh, developing Intel's advanced logic technologies. Hi, I'm Mark Dohr, and I work in the uh, Software and Services Group, uh, platform software stuff, firmware, BIOS, operating systems. I am Bruce Horn, I work in the New Devices Group, uh, Smart Device Innovation with the Smart New Devices. I'm Vic Cha from Internet of Things Group. I focus on data analytics and the predictive modeling. And my name is Knut. Uh, I'm a storage technologist and uh, I'm primarily involved in our uh, SSDs and our storage interfaces. So with that, the procedure is you raise your hand, you wait until you get a mic, and then uh, I will point to whoever happens to be holding one of the two mics and uh, we'll fire up. All right, mic on the end over here. Hello. Um, this is probably a softball, top secret, branded thing, but when you look at the mobile laptop, you know, and the progression up through server, as it collapses down in geometry, it's right here. Your Newtonian approximation ends at some point, practically speaking. Mark's assured us in the last session that he's good to seven nanometers. Something's got to happen down at that bottom end in terms of your convergence of products. It becomes more of a continual spectrum, something. Where do you see the differentiation down at that end? When, how do you see that convergence happening in the next five to 10 years? Wow, I don't think that's an SSD question. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you start by at least like assuring everybody that Moore's Law is not dead? And will you use time while you're saying that to stall and figure out who else is going to take the other half of the question? <laughs> All right, so at least uh, speaking for the uh, process side of the transistor side of Intel, uh, you know, we, of course, are announcing, have announced that our 14 nanometer technology is in the line of production. Uh, our 10 nanometer technology is uh, in the full development mode. Uh, it should be ready in about two years, and I'm spending most of my time on the 7 nanometer technology, which I believe is also doable about uh, two years after 10. So uh, Moore's Law will continue. We'll provide a uh, ever smaller, faster, lower power transistors. Now, how the product designers use them is another question. But, uh, we'll let them answer that. Uh, let's see here. Who do we have that's the closest to a product now? You probably are in the history. So, you, I, let me ask for a clarification first. You said that things were collapsing when I didn't understand. It was like a. I thought. It seems that the lower geometries, right? Atomic, there, there are physical limits in atomic scales, okay, so you can't keep having. At some point, Gordon Moore has admitted, there's a point where there's a cliff, okay. You just don't know where that's going to be. You're going to keep pushing processes and materials and everything else. But there's a limit. There's a point at which the atomic scale stops. So when you hit that cliff, as you approach that cliff, it seems to me that Intel is going to change its strategy terms of, hey, I've got this low-end and high-end stuff, and you're going to slowly converge into something that's a more gradual, continuous spectrum of product offering, right? Super low power, more dense, but frankly, the, the geometries, the processes that you're using are very common. It, it just has to happen, right? Is that... So, so, so let me try. So I think when atomic runs out, we'll go subatomic, meaning we will have to innovate and we'll leave Mark to have fun with that. But going back uh, to the product question, I think there's usually this sort of painting uh, that there's a difference between what's needed in the low end and what's needed by server. But when you look at what the cores need to do and the power constraints and things like that, there's actually more things that are the same between a processor that runs in a tight power budget 
in a laptop or below, and a server with the core counts we have. So if you just look at those similarities, it makes a lot of sense for us to focus on the same kind of technologies. So that's one thing. Uh, the other thing that's, I think, people really need to, uh, I guess, internalize or maybe like even about Intel's process is that we're focusing on uh, energy efficiency for computes and very, very heavy uh, power management. I mean, we believe that it's better to run for a very short time, very efficiently, and then turn completely off. So hurry up and wait is much better than running continuously uh, at the lower performance so I think our, as long as Mark keeps going towards subatomic and beyond, uh, we will keep rearranging the microarchitecture so that we're always power efficient. And we always have the right architecture for doing the power management. So I think there will be change for sure, but it won't be necessarily that things change between the low end and the high end because there are so many things in reality that are the same in the basic technology, we will then put together different SOC for the top or the bottom, but not the technologies or the architecture. In addition to the SOC, if you look at the lowest end, smaller form factor, smaller device, uh, IoT device, all the way to the desktop device are built, it's all SOCs because there are diverse IPs built into the system. And for for simple future, we do see continued demand of uh, those uh, silicon capability to drive the requirements that the customer need. In the, my field, like uh, uh, multimedia, the video resolution keep going up, and uh, we used to work with the standard definition of HD, 4K coming up uh, in the couple, last couple of years, and that seems not stopping, and the resolution of the imaging also goes up. All those are very much demanding, very efficient circuitry for specific applications. So the diverse type of uh, circuitry is also important to utilize this uh, circuit area. It's not just uh, uh, multiplier anymore. All right, so we got a lot of cards to rip, to rip through, so we're gonna need like a couple of yes-no type of questions if we're actually gonna burn through all of our cards. Okay, so I don't have one of those. <laughs> uh, so some years ago, I asked you if you had an opinion about the eventual integration of the memory and storage hierarchies. And what you told me at the time was that you really hadn't given that any thought. Now, of course, we've got SSDs that have high-performance silicon storage in them. We have persistent memory, which is the latest version of RAM disk. I'm wondering if you've thought about that idea any more since then. Yeah, you know, as a result of your asking me uh, with that question without giving it any thought a couple of years ago, um, I've, I've had to give it a little bit of thought. And, uh, uh, you know, storage is actually one of the areas that's pretty exciting right now. Traditionally, storage has been a very boring field because uh, uh, by its nature, it's very conservative and, and kind of glacial in, the, in adopting new technologies. And uh, there's a lot of really cool stuff happening. The entire storage hierarchy looks like it's about to get, uh, get uh, uh, shuffled around a little bit. And uh, in the simplest form, you're already seeing that just with the how uh, high-performance SSDs are already causing hard drives to be used in a different tier. You know, the, the SSDs are slipping in above the hard drives, everyone's now doing tiering, hard drives just got pushed down the tier. And so, it, absolutely, the storage hierarchy is getting, uh, getting uh, revamped um, by some of these uh, uh, new technologies. Now that's even with um, a NAND-based SSDs, and of course uh, there's uh, a lot of uh, work being done on next generation NVM, which has performance attributes that look like they're you know, potentially an order of magnitude better than NAND again. And so there looks like there's a lot of room for like jamming more layers into that, uh, that storage hierarchy. And you know, you, you're already seeing that happen just naturally as a side effect to SSDs. And there's also very focused efforts from several outfits uh, including ourselves, uh, to actually jam in uh, new layers and storage hierarchy. And you'll see that. Uh, I think it's a little bit premature right now for us to announce any specifics on what we have going on there. But couldn't we hear from a memory guy? I mean, that was all about storage. Uh, I don't think we have a memory guy here. You've got system architects. So are you asking about what we're doing in servers, for example, integrating memory? or? Uh or won't die in the platform. What I'm asking about is, in the long run, will we still have separate memory and storage hierarchies that are, are different from an architectural perspective, right? 
is, is that really a long-term future when we're talking about silicon storage that has performance figures that are only maybe an order of magnitude away from that of the DRAM in the systems? Well, uh, first let me say that, uh, in my opinion, I don't think we're going to see storage go away because everything turns into memory. Uh, I think that, uh, that there's going to be a memory hierarchy and there's going to be a storage hierarchy. There's not going to be one or the other. Now, the storage hierarchy is already changing, and Pear might be able to say a little bit more about what the memory happening on the memory hierarchy front. Um, but I don't think, we're, uh, at least in my view, I, I would say that because there's so much innovation in memory, that uh, that there's just going to be memory hierarchy and storage doesn't exist anymore. I think maybe this will be too fluffy for you, but if you look at our history, we have integrated everything that makes sense to integrate sooner or later, hopefully yeah, sooner. sooner. So if you just look at a product we released, like uh, Haskell with Iris Graphics and the EDRAM cache, we took the piece of the memory hierarchy that was useful to integrate, and we just pulled it in where it needed to be. So I think you will see going forward over the next couple of generations that we're pulling in the pieces of the memory hierarchy or the storage hierarchy where we need it to be. So yes, we will continue on the path we've been on for, I don't know, 30 years, integrating away. All right. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, a question for Mark, and it's not about EUV. Uh, if, you, if you look at uh, the evolution of process technology, it's strain silicon, which lasted for a few generations. I don't remember if it was two or three. Then we went to high key metal, which lasted for a few generations, then two or three. Now you're in the second generation of, of FinFed, and you've got 10 and 7. How far can you carry FinFed before you will need a different device structure or new materials? <laughs> well, I can't really comment on exactly what our choices uh, have been on, on 10 and what they might be in 7, although on 7 we're, we're still evaluating a couple of different choices, so we haven't made that, that final one. Uh, but trying to get a structure is a pretty good structure. It's, 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 it is a scalable structure, not necessarily requiring a change, but uh, if there is a new structure or a new material that, that's uh, advantageous, uh, Cost effective, we'll pull it up then. What earliest would be seven? Uh, again, I'm not good. Well, okay, I think we've already said that Trigate is, uh, is uh, continuing at, at 10, yes. So I have a question, probably for Pear. Uh, okay, try Stefan. Oh, okay. Well, one of the two of you. So let's say I'm designing a processor core and I want to have uh, somewhere between Haswell and Silverwand and I'd like to have two memory pipelines in there. Uh, what might be the power cost for, say, two pipelines that can do load-load versus what you had, say, in the Halo, which was load and store? I think you need to answer in percentages. <laughs> I tried to get close to yes or no. Numerical is. <laughs> so you're just asking what it would be to take an atom and beef it its memory? Uh, no. What's the uh, what is the incremental power cost to take, say, a configuration where you have one load pipe and one store pipe, and allow the store pipe to be also a load pipe? And you think that's a yes and no question? No. Uh, I, think, I, I think that... Okay, I'll I, try it. Thank you, David. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> or no. Or no. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. We can whiteboard that together. I think it really depends on what width you're going with. And if you go and do that kind of a core in the middle, mm -hmm. you don't want to limit yourself with good memory bandwidth only in the first cache. You really need to follow through into the rest of the system. So if you actually do that as a well-balanced system, the, there is a significant one. There is a noticeable power increase from doing something like that. But it will probably, for the right workload, still be the energy efficient change, right? HPC or whatever. But I would not, I would not do it just in the first level of cash because that would severely limit the number of workloads where it makes any sense. Wow, it looks like this side of the room has got you guys. We're done. We're done. <laughs> <laughs> When will we see a fanless Xeon? Sounds like a user experience question to me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think 
we have anyone here that would answer that, or is? Well, I think the best way the best way to answer it is that we do product releases when we do product releases. <laughs> <laughs> Seven and oh, All right. How about we go back to the back here? Because we're kind of been neglecting that, that, that half of the room for a while. So looking at all the applications that you guys are enabling through data center, internet of things, and the very complex designs and the processors you guys and solutions that you're, you're developing, to what degree do you guys use uh, that infrastructure to develop and validate those applications and solutions that you offer? I'm not sure I quite understand the, the question. Can you like restate it using different words? Sure. <laughs> As you're developing the application uh, solutions or uh, Edison, Galileo, those types of subsystems that you're providing to people, how do you guys validate those with your data center offerings and all the infrastructure that you're providing? So, so you're asking how does the how do we validate like a, like the the Edison comms? For a data center back end that's supporting it, it, it part, partly there's a lot of uh, uh, success stories around the use of cloud and Internet of Things that have been shown over the last uh, since yesterday. Uh -huh. And I'm wondering, to what degree do you guys use that infrastructure to, to validate your own problems, including the things like Edison? Just give them a card. Yeah, give them a card. <laughs> <laughs> To what extent do our engineers use cloud for their work? Yeah. It's like an Intel IT question. Is that it? So let me try to answer that right. question. Get it started, then the other people can, uh, can chime in. Uh, so validation is a very important uh, you know, function for product development. As if you look at the range of products we're trying to develop, you know, we're talking about edge devices and all the way to cloud, and they send data. Uh, you're talking about applications, and I think there are two steps we can do. One is that we can validate that specific ap application on the device that it is going to run. And the second thing is that because we're talking about an integrated system, or even end-to-end, -end, so we need to do an integrated validation. And that integrated validation oftentimes involves workloads in other areas as well. Hey, uh, in terms of storage, if you look at storage not kind of for storage, but as a something that has a presence in a lot of different devices, do you have some ideas of how you how else you might use storage as a platform that you have in all these different types of devices to do something other than just simply store something? Yeah, so first thing is, although that I'm the MC, that doesn't mean that I get all of the questions. So we have some really other really good guys here too. Uh, and so I think you're, you're uh, alluding to the notion of instead of using storage just to store stuff, whether there can be some processing or some intelligence that's, uh, that's closely coupled uh, with the storage. And that's something that I think uh, has been explored and even my team has been looking into that a little bit. And there's some very strange trade-offs to be made about putting intelligence or having the right ratio of intelligence to storage. So conceptually, if I have like a, a RAID array of 16 drives, if I had 16 local processors, how would that compare with one processor that was 16 times as big? And that equation of economies is a little bit strange because normally a larger aggregated resource, you could get much better utilization of it than you can with little tiny resources that are spread around. But that being said, there are some things that are interesting to do local on the device that, um, that might be just inherently better to do there because of the proximity to the data. Uh, and uh, I think we're still just kind of probing around a little bit trying to find what the killer app is that would warrant doing some local processing there that is suitable for doing locally as opposed to being just as easily done in a general purpose CPU, which of course scales so fast that, that uh, you, you know, even if you're doing something, you know, 30% faster in the in a SSD today by doing it local, the, the general CPU is like increasing in performance so fast that you fall behind really quick. And so it has to be something that's just mind-bogglingly better. 
to do uh, locally in the, in the device before it really is a sustainable benefit for it uh, being there. And right now, I'm still trying to grapple with, you know, trying to figure out what is the killer app, the, the killer function that makes sense to do there. And if someone's got one, please come catch me over happy hour or something. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Hey, Knut, I, I think the other thing that I would add is the one thing that's worth more than the storage is the data that is on the storage. So we are putting a lot of investment into figuring out what's the right way to protect the data that's going into everything from how do we seal keys in the platform, when does it make sense to do encryption on a storage device, if you're doing encryption on the platform, watch these team is working to ensure that we have highly optimized algorithms to do that, taking advantage of our hardware architecture. So I, I think there's a lot of looking at storage not just as it doesn't matter what you're reading or writing, but being able to actually manage the security attributes of the storage as well. Yeah, certainly encryption is an obvious function that uh, we've already put into those devices and that's pretty efficient. All right, in the back over here. The good news is I have two yes no questions. All right. <laughs> you're 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 say. It's story again, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Well, that's not true. Uh, regarding the, the smart data that you have in the uh, SSDs or hard drives and whatever, is there any chance that Intel could drive the industry to standardize those smart data because they're from vendor to vendor, they've never been the same thing, and for the management side, it's a nightmare to decipher what those register me. And my second part of my question is, more a chipset question in this case, could the, the, the CPU uh, give access to the smart data through the, probably the PECI interface to, uh, to give it uh, an out-of-band access for a board management controller to read through the PECI, read the smart data into the drives? All right, so I'll take the first part of the question. While I'm doing that, you guys figure out who's taking the second part of the question. Uh, in terms of standardizing the smart attributes for SSDs, um, I, I completely agree with you. It's kind of a mishmash right now. And for whatever reason, this, the smart spec itself only defines the mechanism. It doesn't, it doesn't define the standardized attributes. And it's kind of invited a, a, a scenario where all of the storage customers uh, have their own unique set of smart attributes. Um, that's unfortunate, and uh, I don't know what exactly the barrier is to standardizing that. Um, I think that with some of the work that's being done with new storage interfaces like NVMe, we now have an opportunity to, to, to standardize some things that haven't been standardized for a long time because we are creating a new interface. And so the legacy of the, you know, the history of us being all different, maybe that can be flushed as a, uh, as a side effect of us all jumping to a new interface. And so I think the best opportunity we might have for rest of some better control there might be with the transition to NVMe. Now, in terms of exposing that through a, sounds like more of an API question than a CPU question, how you, how you access the smart attributes from a, uh, uh, on the platform or? It's a matter of, oh, okay. a matter of uh, giving a, a hardware path for all of them management because the smart data is read readable only from the OS and application and above. Um, but when you have a board management controller uh, on a, any server, and the SSD is still one of the weakest link, you know, in in, this, in the system. After the fans and the power supply, the first thing to fail is the SSD, mm -hmm. and we don't have any means of uh, advanced failure or out of band diagnostic. You know, when it hangs. You don't have any access to the smart data anymore, so it's a it's a weak part of the system, and it's not manageable out of band. So having the big interface or something else, it's a yeah. So is not a big at least on our our latest uh, data center PCIe SSDs, uh, there's an SM bus interface uh, that's also uh, available on those SSDs, and uh, I think we're getting better maturity on having the out of band mechanisms for temperature monitoring at least, uh, so that uh, the uh, the baseband controller that's controlling the fans have a way to ask the drives what the temperature is so you can control the fans in the, on, uh, in the out of band kind of a sense. Uh, maybe that mechanism is something that could be a, a ex extended uh, for the, uh, the baseband or the, the back uh, plane processor to access more stuff. Um, but that probably would be the, uh, the, the most convenient mechanism because that out of band channel is already starting to get plumbed for other reasons. 
So is that what you're asking for? Is is it a, you know uh, access to more um, telemetry info? Yeah, we need, we need much more than temperature. We need. Uh, the, the gas gauge, you know, the life expectancy of the driver sure. or one thing. So. Yeah, but once the mechanism is in place, then the amount of stuff that we can deliver across the mechanism, that's kind of a second order thing to worry about, right? But if we can put the mechanism in place, then we have the facility necessary to be capable of delivering more of that stuff. And right now, I think the, uh, the mechanism that we're starting to see more and more of on our PCIe guys is uh, the use of SM bus for a sideband uh, information, which is first being used for fan control. So, so can it, maybe this is, uh, if somebody treats you to a glass of wine, you can continue? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Go ahead. Hello. Um, so my question is a bit less technical than everyone else's, but as a newcomer to this industry, I feel like I should ask it. So uh, I've seen silic the silicon industry as something of a really, really long race. and. From what I've seen in the past couple of years, does Intel even see anyone still in the race like behind them? Because like I haven't seen an AMD computer in stores for years. So like, <laughs> and, when, and if you don't see anyone behind you, how do you keep the drive to innovate like within your teams and within your companies when there's no one like really chasing you? What, what do you have in your pocket? <laughs> <laughs> A Samsung. I think you answered your question. <laughs> <laughs> Whether it's behind or in front or on the side, right, there is plenty of competition. And I think there is a lot of good reason to, uh, to be parallel. And we are. <laughs> in the back. So uh, I'll start with a quick problem statement. I work in a high density virtualization environment. And uh, from a performance standpoint, I can easily measure CPU, network, disk I.O., and kind of identify the victims and the bullies in my environment to move them around. But the one thing I can't measure is memory bandwidth. So I got some systems, big SQL servers, BI boxes, that become the, the bullies. Everybody else becomes the victims. And when you look at our three or four main performance indicators, the one thing I can't see is memory bandwidth. So my question is, are you guys going to do anything to instrument the memory bus so I can at least look at bandwidth. I'd like to look at latency, but bandwidth would be the, the first thing. <laughs> I asked this question like three or four years ago, and I actually got a little private conference over in the corner afterwards with the specific to processors. But so I can't be the first one to ask this question. Right? This is one of the like main things in a computer that we can't touch your feel, I can test it, but I can't measure it. We have uh, counters in our processors for bandwidth utilization, so maybe we really do need to step off in the corner afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> I might need to bring somebody with me for protection. <laughs> no, I'll give you my card and I'll try to funnel you to the people who, uh, who set up VTune and other tools that measure those things for you. Unfortunately, VTune would be great no, if it was no, on... No. You'll talk to the right people. I think we can sort it out. Thank you. All right. Where's the mic at now? Over there. Very good. Yeah, because Intel would seem to be a couple of levels removed from end users, uh, I find it intriguing that you have a director of uh, UX experience. Uh, and I'm, um, I'd be interested to learn what you believe your contributions will be in the area. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very serious question. I'm fairly certain my contribution is always negligible. Um, so Intel has had user experience research for nearly 15 years in various parts of the company. The purpose for having it has always been that we believe that if you have some line of sight to what consumers and indeed enterprise will want over the time horizon, you can actually direct your technology development in that vein. So we, as we first came on board, as UX people at Intel did early pathfinding for things like Mahalan and Sandy Bridge, and actually trying to work out back in 99, 2000, what it was that people would care about in their computational environment in 2008, 2009. So we do a range of different work. Some of it is about pathfinding and needs finding. Some of it's about how do you identify current pain points and work through to resolve them. So if you were uh, in the keynotes, uh, Brian and everyone else's keynote first thing yesterday morning, you actually would have seen a range of work that came out of my various research labs. So the notion of 
developing next generation client platforms that don't need wires or passwords came from the work we did with consumers all the way through to the algorithms that run the heartbeat monitoring in the earphones came out of my lab as did the camera work that was on the tablet that was in Michael Dell's hands. So we do a range of work that runs from needs finding and pathfinding to tech exploration. And the point of it has always been you need to have an eye to where technology is going to make the right decisions about what kind of building blocks you make. Okay, I think the mic is queued up already over here. Thanks. Uh, this may be a question for uh, Genevieve, maybe for some of you security folks as well. Um, do you think that people need to relax their notions of privacy for smart devices and Internet of Things to really reach its full potential? I, I, th I think the, the short answer is no, but I, I think one of the things that we do recognize is the level of uh, attestation a user has or authentication does scale based on the use model. If you're playing words with friends, you know, just having a device in your presence is probably suitable. If you're wiring $2 million to the Cayman Islands, you probably need more than that. So part of what we're doing is making sure that the underlying framework for things like authentication can comprehend a broad range of scalable security models that not only understand how much do we trust that you really are you, but also other contextual elements that the other party might care about. How much do we trust your platform? Where physically are you? Are you physically somewhere that makes sense? And we're actually working all of these things together at the platform level into the overall identity strategy that was hinted at in a few of the sessions. And I think the second part of the answer to that question is privacy is not a universal human truth. It is understood in different ways by different people, by country, by history, by age, by gender, by location and experience. And one of the things that you could say that was a constant in privacy is that it has meant different things over time, right? What we regarded it to be five years ago is different than this moment in time. I think when we look at user trends, both on the consumer and the enterprise side, and we look at it globally, we see there has been a remarkable shift over the last 17 months, well, 16 months, perhaps unsurprisingly, um, about people's ideas about what data is it about them in circulation, what does it mean to have that data circulate, and how do they want to think about and respond to that. You see a patchwork of regulatory frameworks on a global scale starting to regulate what data can be collected, how it can be stored, who it can be shared with, and under what circumstances. And even if you just were to track things like the rise of really lightweight anonymization apps, so I'm thinking of Whisper, I'm thinking in some ways of a bunch of other things in that sphere, there is a clear interest on consumers' parts of engaging with the digital world and maintaining a certain level of information about them just for them. And I think that space becomes fascinating as it plays out, right? And I suspect we're at a point in time where we can say it might have been too early to call the privacy genie out of the bottle three years ago. And in fact, the very people who we might have said let it out of the bottle are sticking it back in again. So I mean, for me, there's some really interesting stuff in what Consumers of all ages are doing, and what those things might point to in terms of exactly the stuff that Steve is talking about, in terms of security and, and anonymization needs in particular. Does your research point to any, I guess, differences in the youth of today? Like millennials seem like they, they have a much different uh, idea of what privacy actually means. Yeah, what's interesting is that we seem to have had a skip generation. So if you look at the trailing edge of millennials and the front edge of Gen Z, so kids who are now 12 to 18, their behaviours in terms of where they share information with whom and what the nature of the information is looks completely different than their older siblings and the cohort immediately ahead of them. And I think it's safe to say that what we might have seen was a moment of behaviour that went in tandem with the technology, but now that younger cohort is actually engaging in very different ways about what they choose to share and with whom. And they may not call it privacy practices, but there are some very uh, clear behaviors about what information they choose to make public, what they want to attach their names to, and what services they are using for themselves that reflect very different and much more subtle understandings of privacy than we might have. Thank you. Okay, we have the mic on this side over here. In terms of the Internet of Things, as a, as a social scientist, uh, what do you see as either being kind of you know, utopian dreams to come true or kind of a you know, nightmare 
ways that may be realized in, in that environment from, from, a, from a social scientist perspective? Well, I mean, I think the moment that the news came out of Japan that the first smart toilet had been hacked was, <laughs> was kind of that moment of going, okay, smart things, what will the hacks of them look like? Um, I think from my lab and our research point of view, for us, there's a couple of things that are different things, which is we're not very good at talking about who the people are that are going to have to design it, implement it, maintain it, regulate it, will be the subjects and objects of it. There's a lot of people that will be touched by the Internet of Things, and we, we tend to just go with the Internet of Things and forget that someone's going to have to fix it when it breaks, and someone else is going to regulate it. I think there's the second piece where well, we're as guilty of it as anyone else, but when we talk about it, we talk about smart homes, smart cities, smart buildings, and forget that where those buildings are is going to make a huge difference. What it means to make a building smart in Sydney may be very different than in San Francisco, London, Jakarta, or Istanbul. And what it means to think about homes in those formulations are different, who lives in them, what the kind of infrastructure is, so there's the where it happens is, I think, in some ways really interesting, but it's going to look very different in different places. And then the last piece is, it, things is not what really is going to get connected to the internet, right? It's stuff. And that may sound like a semantic parsing, but we know that a toothbrush and a traffic light are two radically different objects. They sit in different places in our lives, we view them differently, but they are tall upright things with something at the top. And it is easy to kind of go, yeah, 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 it's just things. But the reality of what you might want an internet-connected toothbrush to do, and parenthetically why you would want an internet-connected toothbrush, and an internet-connected traffic light are two very different things. And so for me and the work we've been doing in my team has been very much about how do we start to put some meat on the bones of what that looks like as it actually happens. So where are the places where there have been early Internet of Things deployments? What are the unexpected things that appear from that? And how do you start to think about making the Internet of Things space a little more complicated and surfacing what the real opportunities are going to be? Where? Given the furious space of innovation and the demands for all the things that are happening in the world today, right? Internet of Things, you know, big data analytics, our cloud, you know, uh, software different infrastructure, dark data centers, everything automated. So you all are in the cutting edge of innovation. If you have a wild dream, what will the system for the future look like in 10 or 20 years? That's not a yes, no question. <laughs> yeah, that's not a yes or no question. You're asking us, what do we imagine the system in 20 years would look like? You know, 20 years ago, if I was going to try to imagine what the systems look like today, I wouldn't come anywhere close. And so I don't know why I would be any better at it now than then. But maybe some of my fellows here are much better at it than I am. Well, in which case, let me put, you know, one of the elephants on the table. I'd like to imagine that it was designed by a slightly more diverse group than we represent. <laughs> <laughs> We have both a Norwegian and a Swede here. <laughs> That's true. We have a nice Scandinavian diversity. I'm proud of you for <laughs> I'd like to uh, quote uh, two survey results by Intel recently. One is that 60% uh, of the people surveyed in the United States think that driverless cars are safer for people in the city. The second thing is that almost 50% of the people think that drones can provide better services than people. So I just get that started. Yeah, I, I do have to point out that our SSDs have firmware in them, and knowing about that, I'm not going to be the first guy to sit in that driverless car. <laughs> <laughs> All right, somebody's got it in the ice cream cone. <clears throat> Who's got it? Stand up if you got it. All right, go, go for it. Okay, um, well, actually, uh, to carry on those threads, right, to put those threads together and see if we can get some uh, movement uh, on the get some answers, so I'm a wireless guy, and I still think that uh, as we move to 10 or 20 years time, right, uh, one of the things that we haven't really talked about this week is how we're going to connect these Internet of Things. How are we going to connect that toothbrush and that uh, moving car? It's, it's, uh, it's clear that we need many different solutions and many different architectures, but really at the end of the day, what we're moving towards is um, 
really uh, how, we, how are we going to move connectivity and uh, determinism of communication so that we make sure that in some cases the critical information got through, in some cases we can wait for that message not get through. I'd like to pass that on to the Internet of Things guy, Link. That's for you, Link. I don't care, it was also at the other end. <laughs> well, the answer is not a yes and no. It's more involved, but actually, um, I, I think as you said, that the technology, the Internet of Things is actually a very complex technology. Uh, so we're talking about, first of all, what is Internet of Things? You know, people think about things are from devices, you know, devices or physical devices or physical objects. Sometimes people call it phys you know, cyber physical systems. And uh, but if you look at Cisco's definition of the Internet of Things, it actually includes devices, people, analytics, and data. So uh, when we combine all these things together, I think, yes, we have great potential for business transformation and also technology innovation. Hey, the, the, the one thing I'd like to add to that is I think in order to get to that vision, it's going to take redefining the communication infrastructure as critical infrastructure. Right, right now, when communication cease, when you can't get a cell signal, it's an inconvenience. If we truly build out the Internet of Things to this vision, and cars stop driving, people's health starts failing, when communication goes down, that, that's a far worse situation than you have today. So I think if we're serious about doing it, we need to put a very different level of importance on keeping the communication infrastructure up. Right, right. So, so can I, before you, can I ask that one more thing, though? Um, ask, if you are a client guy, you're thinking Wi-Fi. If you're a phone or tablet person, you think cellular. But if you go and look at the frequency spectrum, and this may be what you're pointing at, there is a very wide range of other communication uh, standards that people put out there for these reasons, right? Uh, fire rescue uses entirely separate and dedicated frequencies. My assumption is that when we move forward and do some of these like mission critical uh, systems, they may go on completely different frequency allocations, and that is appropriate. No, 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 but what I wanted to leave you with thought, right, and the audience is that there are still uh, only about two, two billion people that have uh, really connectivity and have not access to the internet and knowledge. There's a huge number of people, even in this country, North America, that cannot afford to get, to get access to the internet. So how do we, we, we can do all this smart silicon, but at the end of the day, how do we bring that silicon, that knowledge of the internet? Um, otherwise, what will happen is that uh, yeah, there will be people will be left behind. Yeah, that's what I wanted to reach out to you I think vote. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do contribute to policy, so I'm in the middle of it. Don't worry. All right, over here. This is a question for the security people. Um, I noticed with Intel lately there's been a big drive to kill passwords and replace them with biometrics. But the problem with that is, how do I change my password if it's my face? Do you have any thoughts on that? Sure. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, so, you know, the issue is passwords are really poor for a lot of reasons. They're, number one, transitive. So uh, you can give your password to someone. Uh, they're socially unmanageable by the bulk of the population. People use the same password in all sorts of places. They shouldn't, without, a typical consumer comprehending that if they use their same password on you know, Bob's Pizza as their bank, that even if it's a strong password, when Bob running his server on Windows XP unpatched gets hacked and the guy gets his password, logging on to Wells Fargo is not that big a stretch. So I, I think one of the key things is it's not just about biometrics, it's about moving to the next phase of authentication which is a combination of device identity, so making sure that you're actually on a device you should own, uh, using things that are non-transitive, and that's where biometrics is very important. Uh, and a lot of the research that we're doing in this space is to ensure that it's not only you, but it's you right now. So we have a whole spectrum of technology that 
we call liveness technology that proves that it's actually you in front of the camera or the microphone versus holding up a picture or some other injection sort of attack where you've copied somebody's look and look and playing them back. So I'd just be a little careful in characterizing it as only biometrics. I think that's one element of it. Now watch, did you want to add anything? No, no that, was, that was great. All the way in the back. I just wanted to follow up on Genevieve's point about gender participation in the industry. And I've been in the industry 30 years and I, don't, I personally have not seen that much forward progress. So I'm just wondering what corporations like Intel will do to address that in the next 30 years. Well, I mean, I think one of the things that's been fascinating to watch over the last six months in the Valley is how willing tech companies have been to start making the data transparent. Because I think in order to drive in order to drive a robust, diverse participation board, you actually need to know what your starting line is. And I think, you know, as we've seen a range of different companies open up their data about who is in the company and what the, in some ways, the complexion of the company looks like, it starts to make it easier to know where the problems are you have to address. And, you know, any of us who work in this area, I'm sure you know well, this is a problem that you have to tackle in lots of different places. It's about how do you ensure that you are keeping all kinds of kids engaged all the way through the school system, into the university system, into both the university system and industry. And it's not going to be an easy fix. It's a long-term commitment. Fortunately, it's something Intel remains passionately committed to from our CEO and our president on down. Uh, all of my peers here are committed to helping me continue to drive that conversation forward, but I think it's a it is a slow and long process that you have to be willing to commit to and know that it takes a really long time to be successful. It's just not a simple overnight solution. I wish there was. And it's also quite different in different countries, right? Malaysia, for example, we're interesting enough to do fairly well on new hires. So it's an uneven uphill battle. Yeah, and I think that's absolutely right. And it's an uphill battle and different by different disciplines. So I come out of a field where 75% of the graduates are female. <laughs> you know, we know that it looks different in computer science than it does in other parts of engineering. In fact, there are parts in the sciences where we're approaching 50-50 in the United States. Were we in India or China, 50% of engineering graduates in both countries are women. Now the drop-off happens in other places in the pipeline. So, I mean, Per's right, it looks different in different places. It's not a kind of a, a single factor. And truthfully, in the sciences in the US, if you hold computer science to one side, there have been huge strides made in the rest of the STEM field. All right, if you got the mic, use it. Yeah, very quickly. It takes a lot of money to do what you guys do. A lot of your money still comes from the PC group. I think, or I'd like to think we've got over this area that tablets are going to take over the world, but I'd love to get anyone's perspective on what MIPS intensive applications do you see at the consumer client level that will continue to allow you guys to kind of sell up that stack and be able to segment that core market to make that money to reinvest in all this innovation. Okay, this sounds like a software spiral question. Which is that you, Mark? I might be closest to the level where system software is not really applications, but and I, I suspect the the generation of content by everyone. And I don't know about you, but in my family, my kids are constantly waving the cell phones in front of them, taking pictures of this, that, and other. What they choose to do with that data uh, is. Uh, I've got a couple of absolute Instagram freaks in my house. <laughs> uh, they'll take a picture and they'll uh, augment it in some way that'll uh, make fun of one of their sisters and send it off to all of their friends or something. Those kinds of content creation things are very quick and very, uh, very instant. Uh, my eldest daughter is now at university. Uh, she's uh, doing a lot of work with video content creation, which requires a lot of post-processing to assemble something interesting. Right? You end up with lots of different clips of things that she's trying to tell a story around and, and you really have to do a lot of post-processing to assemble that down into something that is a few minutes worth of, of interesting story told with the with the clips that she's taken. That kind of uh, video processing is, is extremely, uh, uh, extremely mixed uh, hungry to the point that she demanded a new Haswell machine because she didn't have enough horsepower in the laptop that she had previously. <laughs> Um, you know, my, my hope is that that kind of uh, you know, personal content curation is, is going to be a big one. Is that good enough? 
is a pretty good uh, angle for that one. And uh, when we look at the looking for the multimedia space, uh, I'm not talking to people who work on this uh, solution for phone and tablet, phone space. Because of the limitation of the form factor, the battery life, the computability on those uh, space, the amount of intelligence you can put into the application is quite limited. Right? Uh, on one hand, we're trying to bring those compute to those form factor, which is what we're doing with uh, Core M and making those uh, 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 tablets really perform as much as we have with the traditional laptop. But also, it's a, a clear trial that uh, there's a uh, very big intensive applications still very much out there. And uh, getting those applications to the end user's hand, I think that's the key. Because uh, if you look at a, a lot of uh, professional video editing software, they are actually doing a fantastic job. They are used to consume the weeps and deliver very good solutions. But those applications are not available for uh, uh, consumers, right? So there's a gap, and uh, we are looking for we we'll actually see some of the change already in the uh, industry that uh, put into the simple touch-based uh, VIP. That uh, very simple and a few touch because they are content created. Uh, that's fantastic for a lot of users. And also the computer we put in there for uh, video processing, video transcoding, video analytics also help a user to create stories. So in the end, what you share with the people are not just a raw content, it's a story. Creating a story of the raw content requires a lot of compute. This compute will be much more valuable in the bigger form factor space. So that's also accessible to a, a broader content. So there is a, 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 a broad spectrum from the very small handful of wearable device all the way to the cloud that uh, each one has their own play, place in this uh, uh, continuum. So I think that's still continue that way. And the PC today does play a pretty strong role for a lot of personal computing, uh, uh, personal content, I think that's what will continue to grow. All right, we're queued up here, right? Go ahead. Hi, uh, completely different subject. Uh, we're using the Rangely processor, which is a, a great processor for offloading the front end, doing DPI and um, all sorts of packet analysis and generation. And uh, it's really nice and low power and compact. But for some reason, it only acts as a root complex and not an endpoint on the PCI Express bus. So you need a non-transparent bridge and that kind of wrecks the whole thing, adds to the power and adds to the space and everything. And the discussions I've had with some of your guys uh, doesn't look like you're looking at putting an endpoint on that processor. So if it's meant to be a communications processor for front-end cards, why doesn't it have an endpoint PCI Express? And are you planning on fixing that? in the next generation. So I think this is another um, business card question, so please come up. Back. All right, sorry we didn't, uh, we didn't cover that one, but uh, here we'll trade a, a business card with you and, uh, and we'll get it taken care of. All right, who's got the... Way in the back. About as far back as you can go. I actually have a different question. I'm a huge fan of technology, love the wearables, love you know, the vision of complete wireless. But are there any studies being done, or is Intel working with anybody to understand the impacts of all of that um, emissions on the human body, and what um, implications that may have with all of those wireless charging, wireless information going across um, on human bodies? Well, I think Jen, you can tell you what goes to the psyche. But I think you're asking, what does it do to like the physiology? We participate, <laughs> we participate in some standard setting bodies that do that kind of research, so we know it's being done. Um, and it's definitely something that is regulated differently in different countries too. So I mean, there's a piece of it, but are we actively doing research on it? No, but we are involved with bodies and researchers that do. Yeah, that's probably not our core competency, right? <laughs> okay, right here. So you guys have an extremely rich and well-developed security model for the CPU, which is great. And that keeps our data together uh, in one place and keeps my machine mine. Uh, now we have cache-coherent GPUs with access to all the virtual memory. And my understanding is, first of all, both it's possible to root machines from the GPU. 
And two, we have no GPU security model whatsoever. Uh, when can we look forward to that being fixed? Yeah, so the, the short answer is we're actually looking at intra-chip security for all the IP blocks. So uh, CPU, GPU, uh, one of the things I talked about in my talk this morning is we've actually set up our SFC architecture to have an access control model where every IP block has an identity and you can apply access control to the device such that an IP block only has access to the things that it needs. So in the case of the GPU, which was your direct question, uh, it does honor uh, DMA protection if it's on platforms that support our VTD architecture. It also on other platforms like our Atom platforms that don't yet have VTD. We have other mechanisms to restrict access to memory uh, for the GPU that an OEM can basically lock out regions. So since we're about out of time, the short answer is yes, uh, but uh, it is a little bit more complicated than that. So speaking of short out of time, we are actually out of time. Um, we're actually pretty approachable, or at least some of us are. And uh, we're pretty easily recognizable. And so please do catch us at happy hour or at the showcase or in the hallway or whatever. Um, we're all pretty likable guys, and we're happy to talk about our stuff. Thank you very much for coming to IDF. And thanks for coming.